This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I just want to set up tonight's event, which is about um, LGBT domestic violence in the context of um, kind of the work that we're doing. And one of the uh, programs, um, I was actually just talking about it in the next room that I'm proudest of and saying that I'm proudest of, is the work that we do in training judges. We are the only organization in the country that directly trains judges about LGBT people and legal issues affecting LGBT people. And that's because we're part of UCLA School of Law. It's because because we're not an advocacy organization, um, and it's because they invite us in and trust us to prevent, present the information uh, in an objective manner. So this is a new program um, that we're asking, uh, we're presenting to you and hoping that you learn from a lot, um, but it's also kind of a test run from a new program um, that we want to um, use to train judges around the country so that we hope you enjoy the program and uh, give us a lot of feedback when it's over. Um, Leading the program, um, if you haven't met him already, is Darren Mitchell, who is an expert um, in domestic violence issues in general um, and is an expert in judicial training. So um, he is one of our team at the Williams Institute working on these issues, and we couldn't have a better person to lead this effort. Thanks so much, Brad. As I'm sure many of you know, domestic violence will affect you or someone you know, a client of yours, a friend, at some point in your legal career. And um, if, you're, if you plan to become a family law attorney or focus on domestic violence, of course, you're going to see lots of survivors. And um, even if you focus on family law and, and, don't, and, and don't consider yourself to be someone who focuses on domestic violence, certainly a large number of clients who walk through your doors will be survivors or abusers. So it's something that we think lawyers, no matter what facet of law they practice, really have to have an understanding of. You may be asked as an IP litigator to help a friend, a family member, who's trying to escape uh, abuse. And it's very, it's very helpful, I think, for you to know a little bit about what the legal system's response is to domestic violence and, um, and what kind of help the person can expect. Um, as you'll learn this evening, domestic violence really is nothing short of an attack on and in, in many instances, it's really an attempt to utterly destroy a person's sense of self and safety. Um, and, and so abusers really want nothing less than to take away an individual's ability to make decisions on his or her own. They want the survivor to have to decide before taking any action, how is the abuser going to react? So the constant fear and threat that, that folks who are in domestic violence situations is something that's very real and something that many of us are working to try to address through the legal system and outside of the legal system. As you all know, I'm sure, survivors f face a tremendous number of obstacles both within the legal system and outside it in trying to get help. And today, tonight, we're going to actually focus on a group that sp faces some additional, some special obstacles that we're going to explore um, this evening. And, um, and of course, I'm talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender survivors. The barriers that these individuals face stem from all kinds of things, including homophobia, transphobia, transphobia um, the, the, in, uh, the uh, inability of the legal system to recognize the relationships that, that gay people have. There are all kinds of societal and community um, obstacles that are placed, in addition to what folks in, in uh, LGBT people who are abused face within the legal system. And we're going to address all of these kinds of issues tonight to give you an introduction to what these obstacles are and um, also hopefully leave you with some ideas about how to overcome them, both through individual advocacy on, the, on behalf of an individual survivor within or outside of the court system, but also systems advocacy, because I think everyone here would agree that that um, the laws as they currently stand don't necessarily offer the protections we would like to see for LGBT survivors. And so the part of, of, of every attorney who's working in this area's job is to think about how we can change systems as well as provide the individual advocacy that's needed in particular cases. 
I can't tell you how excited I am about the, um, the, the amazing national experts we've assembled here um, this evening. You're really benefiting from folks from all over the country, including LA, but outside of LA, who have spent many years thinking about and training on these issues. Before I introduce them, I just want to give you a brief rundown of what we're going to do this evening so you know what to expect. We're going to start by looking at LGBT domestic violence sort of in context. We're going to try to understand domestic violence as a, one person's use of, of uh, a pattern of power and control and exploitation over another person. And also start to talk a little bit about how domestic violence, as those of us who have worked in this area for years, recognize it is different from how the legal system may recognize it. Um, there are legal definitions of violence that may not apply in particular cases. And so we want to have a, an understanding of what domestic violence really means to survivors, even if it doesn't amount to what the legal system would recognize as domestic violence. In addition, we'd like to, in our sort of introductory se segment, which will go for about an hour, help you uh, learn to recognize how the specific sort of tactics um, tools of abuse that, that, that LGBT and LGBT relationships are used by abusers um, to, help, to help them further their power and control over an individual. The second half of our training this evening will focus on legal remedies. And in that segment, we're going to help you, um, using some scenarios, identify the particular needs of LGBT domestic violence survivors, safety, economic, uh, other needs that they have, and then begin to think about the obstacles to addressing those needs and how to overcome those obstacles. And uh, as well, the systems advocacy uh, piece that I mentioned earlier. So now I'll introduce you to our fabulous uh, faculty. First to speak will be um, Kristen Tucker, who we welcome from the Northwest Network of Bisexual, Trans, Lesbian, and Gay Survivors of Abuse based in Seattle, Washington. She'll be leading us through the LGBT domestic violence in context segment, and she's the program manager at the Northwest uh, Network. She's been an educator, an activist, and an advocate in the anti-violence and LGBTQ movements since 1998. Her work has a primary focus in providing direct advocacy with adult LGBTQ survivors of DV, as well as training and supervising a staff of community advocates and interns. She's provided countless local, regional, and national trainings on increasing programs' capacities to provide services to LGBTQ people for almost seven years. The uh, legal remedy section will be co-led by two presenters. The first is, and I should say, Kristen, you probably see her name tag. She's on the way on the right or on my, your left. Um, the, fir uh, the first I'll introduce is um, Tara Slavin, who's from Los Angeles. She'll be co-presenting on Legal Remedies, and she is the lead staff attorney and program manager of the Domestic Violence Legal Advocacy Project at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center. She's responsible for overseeing the delivery of a, uh, comprehensive legal services for LGBTQ survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. She's also responsible for training DV and legal services providers on these issues, and um, she's provided trainings to hundreds of attorneys and advocates across the country in her career. As you'll see when you consult her bio and the program materials, because I'm not going into all the details, she served on numerous um, committees, national, local advisory groups, and other, and other uh, organizations addressing LGBT uh, domestic violence issues. Finally, I'm pleased to um, welcome Sharon Staple from New York. She's a, also co-presenting on the Legal Remedies section. She's the executive director of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, the AVP. The AVP's mission is to eliminate hate violence, sexual assault, and domestic violence affecting LGBTQ communities through direct services, advocacy, organizing, and public education. She presents trainings on, on violence against and within the LGBTQ communities throughout the country. If you consult her bio, you'll see that she a, has a wealth of experience working on family law and domestic violence issues in a, in a very wide range of settings, including um, having taught at the City University of New York School of Law and at Hunter College on these issues. So let me turn it over to Kristen, please, who will lead us through the first segment. Hi. How's it going? Um, so again, my name is Kristen. I'm really excited to be here speaking with all of you. Um, just a couple of things um, about the time that I'll be speaking. Please feel free to ask questions as we're moving along. Um, I'm pretty hard of hearing, and so if you would like to ask a question, obviously we want to get a mic to you, and so if you could raise your hand around, um, we'll make sure that someone gets over to you and we can respond to your question. I would prefer this to be as interactive as possible. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your experiences, your feedback, your questions. Um, so. Um, Darren did a great introduction about the orientation of my section of the training this evening where we're really going to be talking about expanding our definition and understanding of domestic violence outside of um, the legal definitions, looking at what it means on the ground for individuals and then specifically in the context of LGBTQ communities. 
And so the network has been providing services um, to uh, LGBT survivors of domestic and dating violence since 1987. And so we have developed over many years a lot of you know, different models. Um, we'll be talking briefly about um, the Northwest Network's assessment tool, which is um, a tool that we train on nationally um, that we work with primarily advocates, but also folks in other professions who are um, working with uh, an individual or a couple where domestic violence is present, giving you the opportunity to help discern how a pattern of power and control is working. So we'll be doing some exercises related to that as well. These are pretty pictures that we have, so that it reminds me to stop and ask if you have questions. <laughs> so, all right. So um, one of the things that we sort of like to start doing um, when we begin these trainings is to just try to expand our understanding of what domestic violence means. And this really speaks, I think, to what Darren was talking about. We think about domestic violence not only as a pattern of power and control and exploitation, but as a process of objectification. So what we know is that the process of battering objectifies survivors. We see people who are using a pattern of power and control or abusing their partners are attempting to turn someone from a subject, so a person who can act, make choices, reflect, and act again, to an object, so things that do not act but are acted upon. Right? So we know that human people, even in the context of domestic violence, are making choices every day. We know that the window of choices, so if I get this amount of choices in my life that is not impacted by domestic violence in my immediate relationship is this wide, we know that choices can become narrower, but choices happen. We also know that at times, people who batter their partners are successful in completely objectifying them. We know that by the high number of domestic violence related fatalities. Um, so it's something we can be thinking about as well. So that this is a process of attempting to turn people from subjects into objects. So for those of you who liked sentence trees or mm -hmm. grammatical mapping. This is a, a good example sort of to help integrate this idea into our mind. So if we look at the top sentence here, subject, verb, object, so those are the, I don't know the proper term, parts of the sentence, mm -hmm. object, that's not important. <laughs> what we know is that the subject here in this sen bottom sentence is Steve. The verb, so the action and what he is doing is kicks, and the object is the ball. So we have Steve kicks the ball, subject, verb, object. Right? And then if we change this to Steve kicks Marcos, we sort of see where we're going here. Right? Nodding is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> You're with me. We're doing it. All right. So, um, you know, this is one way that we like to think about this process of objectification um, that domestic violence is more than just sort of behaviors that we see on a power and control wheel, it's this overall sense of someone's life getting smaller, right? So whose toes take up more space in the room? Whose choices are the same or growing? And who has fewer choices in their everyday life? So we talk about this process of surviving as all of the ways that people resist objectification. One of the most important pieces of our work at the Northwest Network is to really resist um, sort of the essentialism that we have created, I think, over time in the domestic violence movement around who is a survivor and who is a person that batters their partner. What are the characteristics of those people? What is the process or experience of surviving domestic violence like? We've created like narratives and billboards and PSA campaigns that talk about this noble survivor who only did what she had to do, that you know, every action that she had taken had you know, only the most noble of intentions. But what we know in our experience, in my many years of providing direct advocacy and counseling to LGBT survivors of domestic dating violence, is that people make a lot of choices, right? Resisting someone attempting to objectify you is not always nice or clean. You're not always doing the noble thing. And so just the the very basic experience of expanding our understanding of domestic violence outside of a model of heterosexual relationships gives us a sense of breaking apart those stereotypes, those archetypes that we've created. And we want to really also further engage with that sense of really understanding that surviving is a process. It's a complex process that people live in and make choices every day. We really want to be aware, though, of how our work and our assumptions impact the way we interact with people and then impact the services that we provide to them. questions. Let me take my jacket off. I thought because I was coming to a law school I should wear a 
jackets. <laughs> in the Northwest, like dressy wear is when you wear like a nice fleece that zips up and has long sleeves. Um, it's a different way. It's a slower pace. So anyway, I got that for you guys at a store called. I did, really, I did. But it was on sale. It was only eight dollars. So don't feel bad. <laughs> okay. So um, again, we're sort of picking apart these different pieces here. And I think a lot of times we can get into conversations where we're starting uh, to talk about domestic violence, about the language that we use, right? So the connotations of, you know, why do we call someone a victim? Why do we call someone a survivor? What does that mean? Is that interchangeable? Are those things synonymous or not? Right? We can talk about, like, calling someone a victim is disempowering. Calling someone a survivor is empowering. Well, one, we really shouldn't be calling anybody anything but what they want to be called. And we're not necessarily in the next section going to be thinking about that sort of like connotation. We're going to really look at the literal ways that these are experienced in the movement. So when I speak of, uh, speak of the sort of anti-violence, domestic violence movement, that encompasses community advocacy programs, individuals, organizers, attorneys, prosecutors, et cetera. But that what we know is that our definition and our understanding and our analysis of domestic violence is larger than the legal definition. So a lot of the legal definitions that I'm going to be going over are Washington specific, so they may translate here. Maybe Tara would probably be very much able to tell us if that is the case. So when I'm going to be using the term survivor, I'm going to be talking about that in the course of our time as a person who experiences a pattern of power and control by another. And when I use the term abuser or batterer, I'm thinking about a person who establishes a pattern of power and control over another person. Right? So one of the things that we know on our work on the ground in our own personal lives is that domestic violence is a pattern of power and control that occurs 24-7. It's not a moment in time. We think of it sometimes as this sort of pattern. We think of it as a web sometimes, because that can be a little bit visually more helpful, the ways that things are intersecting and interconnecting. We'll talk about sort of examples of what that looks like in a queer context. But also, we know that many if not most, of the tactics that individuals use to exert a pattern of power and control over their partners are in fact quite legal, right? So telling someone that they're stupid, that you hate their family, that they're sleeping around, that they're a bad parent, that's perfectly legal. That has an impact on someone's sense of self, like Darren was referencing. It has an impact on their access to communities, to familial support, right? And so we really need to be aware of the complexities of that and also how our legal definition is not seeing that lived experience on the ground in the same way that we do in our programs every day. It's also important for us to really understand as well, critically, that systems of oppression are also feeding into and contributing to domestic violence. So we see these larger systems of, of power and dominance that are encouraged in our society, racism, classism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, right? And so when we have these examples of how people benefit from having power over another person, that funnels down into that interaction between one person and another person in an intimate relationship. And so it's important for us to have a sense of how systematic oppression functions and how that may be playing into someone's experience of domestic violence, specifically when we're talking about LGBT survivors, right? And if we're looking at the criminal legal system language, that's where, at least in the state of Washington and in my work, I hear the terms victim and perpetrator most often. And so a victim, according to the criminal legal system, is a person against whom a crime of battery has been committed. And a perpetrator, a person who has been convicted of committing a crime of battery. Right? So often this is, this is set up to determine sort of what is happening in a, around a specific incident and a specific period of time. It also ignores that sense of overarching institutional oppression and sort of posits everybody as equal under the law. Many of you may know that that is, in fact, not really true. Right? Many people have experienced inequalities in different ways. One of the things that can happen really easily is that we start to collapse these terms because over time, the anti-violence movement, the domestic violence movement, has really built a very strong relationship with the criminal legal system that when we were trying to figure out a way to hold people accountable to what they were doing to their partners, to their communities, to their families, to their faith communities, that one of the only recourses that we were able to develop was 
punitive punishment through the criminal legal system. And so I think that from my personal perspective that we've gone maybe a little bit farther than what we had envisioned or intended at the beginning um, of that partnership to where often we're sort of interchanging these terms so that a person who's a survivor is a victim and a person who's abuser or batter is always a perpetrator. What do we know about reality? Is that survivors do lots of complicated things in the process of surviving, right? Are some of those things illegal? Yes. Could they be arrested for those things? Yeah. Are they arrested for those things? And so what we have done is create an equal sign here, and we're really going to try to etch those things out. We're going to keep this separate. So this sense of we're going to look at who is surviving a pattern of power and control, who is creating a pattern of power and control, and allow that to determine our response and the services that we provide. We must engage, though, with this other side. So if someone who is a survivor has, in fact, been arrested of a crime that they did, in fact, commit, right? we're going to have to be aware of the consequences to that on their experience. So can anyone give me an example of what happens when you're arrested for domestic violence? Um, I'm sorry, was your question about people who are arrested for domestic violence or convicted? People who are, well, either way, you can take it just to have an example of what are some of the consequences someone might experience. Well, uh, at least in California, I know that if they're convic convicted, there's a mandatory one-year, once-a-week batterers program. Mm -hmm. There's a fine to the domestic violence um, victims restitution fund. Mm -hmm. They're put on probation. There is usually a mandatory court criminal protective order right. protecting the victim from the batterer, depending on, and that can be modified based on the victim's preference. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times I think, based on a specific ins instant, um, the batterer has to move out of the home, not have any contact, um, and if it's serious enough, they would be taken to jail, and when they're released, they wouldn't be allowed to return to, if they share a home together. Mm -hmm. Let's envision that the survivor was the person that was arrested and had to interact with all the systems. What was your name? I'm sorry, I'm Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Thank you. That was a really great answer. Um, so that a survivor had to interact with all the systems that Kevin just mentioned, which were a lot, right? Those are significant in impact on one's quality of life, one's ability to move through the world freely. What would that mean a survivor is directed to those services? It would mean some not good things, I'll tell you that. Yes? It only reinforces their feelings of guilt, their feelings uh, that they were at fault for their, for their actions beforehand that led to the legal system then telling them, now you're at fault, you're the one to blame. So. Yeah. That's, that's really important. What we do know is that a, a consequence of domestic violence is that often survivors internalize blame for what is happening in the relationship. A lot of times that's because someone says it's your fault. Right, all of this is your fault. If you did something differently, I wouldn't have to do this, I wouldn't have to treat you like this, I wouldn't have to say you can't see your mom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we know that those messages are impactful to someone's experience. What we also know, at least in Washington, so I'll speak from that experience, um, that when someone is mandated to a perpetrator's or batter's treatment group, information about their progress, where they live, if they've changed jobs, are given to the victim of the crime, right? So if we're seeing a survivor being funneled into this system, their information being given to the person who is battering them, right? So an abuser or batterer who's technically a victim of a crime, right? We see where this could go in a really complicated way. And one of the things we want to be aware of is that, that there's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of um, discussion and work really um, importantly in the Northwest region um, around victim defendants is the term that they had used for a while. I think it's transitioning into other language. Um, but they were specifically speaking primarily about heterosexual women who have been arrested for the crime of domestic violence. What we know, though, is that in a state where we have a mandatory arrest law, police are dispatched to a domestic violence incident, they are the burden is upon them to assess who the primary aggressor is, right? Those statutes were written to reflect a person who is larger or more intimidating or is less injured. And, and what is that? That leads to like man person, right? Traditionally, like they were trying to set it up in that way, right? To support women who are experiencing domestic violence. What we know though is that when they're showing up and there are two women in a relationship, now what, right? So what we see is that 
it is not an uncommon experience for a survivor to be arrested, even when in fact they were the victim of the crime, right? Whether because they were larger, they were more masculine appearing, they had any other signifier that would make them more vulnerable in the legal system. Right? So it's important for us to be aware of how, one, the importance of separating these languages for everyone, and the particular importance when we're talking about LGBTQ survivors of domestic violence. So I'm going to talk really briefly before we get into the context of um, sort of domestic violence moving beyond the power and control wheel, just a little bit about the Northwest Network's organizational values. And I think the values that really reflect a lot of folks in the LGBT anti-violence movement, which is a little bit different than what, at least in the, in the Northwest, we call the mainstream domestic violence movement. And so our role as advocates and folks who are supporting survivors of domestic violence is to prioritize their self-determination and their sa self -determination and safety. And for folks who are establishing a pattern of power and control and exploitation to support a process of accountability, right? Notice it doesn't say arrest here. Notice it also doesn't say safety first, right? Historically, what we have done, I think, in response to domestic violence is determined that we as providers or we as survivors or we as a movement know what's right for a person. We know that they should come to a shelter, they shouldn't go to the grocery store that they went to, they need to not go to their church, they need to stop going to classes at the school that they had gone to because it's not safe for them. Right? And so when we thought about that critically, I was thinking about something that Darren had mentioned, is that when someone who's experienced domestic violence is having this day-to-day -day lived reality of someone attempting to eliminate their choices, what are we doing then if we're saying prescriptively, we know what's right for you? We do have information and expertise about domestic violence, lethality issues, safety planning, et cetera. But what's most important for us is to understand that someone needs to be self-determining their process of healing, their process of staying, their process of leaving, their process of getting a protection order or not, of calling 911 or not, not us saying that this is the right thing for people to be doing. And again, particularly, we think that this is an important experience when we're looking at um, sort of serving the LGBT community in specific. The nice thing is that the, the law is on our side in the state of Washington. So the WAC is our Washington Administrative Code. And the description of our work as domestic violence advocates, we do advocacy-based counseling. This is actually written by a, a handful of really um, amazing folks who had provided services for a really long time who really talked about the importance of agency, autonomy, and self-determination when we're working with survivors. We also want to consider safety, but that self-determination is the means in that process. And so when we're thinking about all of these things, the legal responses and remedies, it's important for us to also know that we want an individual who's experiencing domestic violence to direct their own process. We are there to provide information, support, and the expertise that we have, but not necessarily to give them the right or wrong way to go. So this is a little bit of a slide about agency. So we talk a lot about people as agents, right? So again, the process of objectification attempts to limit someone's agency, their ability to be the subject of their own life. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about this also when we're doing individual counseling with survivors. But that we really at the Northwest Network move away from an idea that whatever you do is whatever you had to do. It doesn't matter now, right? How does that sound? If someone's coming to me saying, like, I feel really crappy because last night I slapped my partner because I didn't know what else to do. I hadn't slept for three days, right? It's just what you had to do. It doesn't matter now. You didn't have any choice. How does that sound? Perhaps not the most reflective of our supporting of someone's self-determination agency. We want to know that survivors matter and what they do matters. <clears throat> we have, in a lot of ways, developed an understanding that what batters do matters, right? Because they're doing the bad things, right? They're threatening you. They're assaulting you. They're taking control of the finances. What we want to say is that sur what survivors do does. Survivors do matters. We really, really want to put that at the forefront of our conversations, of our work, of our analysis, really prioritizing that we're not talking about something that happens to someone. We're talking about someone's experience and how to support them. So this is just a little um, example. Have many of you have seen the power and control wheel before? You guys have. 
you, if you work in a, um, an anti-violence agency, I travel a lot, and they're everywhere. Everywhere I go, it's like a little piece of home, a power and control wheel. <laughs> I'm going to be in Louisiana next week, and show up in Baton Rouge, and there's a power control wheel to greet me. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, the subject of this wheel and the object of this wheel, Connie, my executive director, who was um, originally supposed to be here, she and her partner are in the process of adopting three babies. It's really amazing. Um, it's a big job. Uh, but she talks a lot about this. She brought this up, and I had never really thought about it before, because I see this all the time. I'm like, power control wheel, OK. But then we think about the subject of the wheel and the object of this wheel. Again, we're talking about what is happening to someone, right? We're not talking about like someone feels intimidated, someone feels someone experiences isolation, right? It's controlling what you do, limiting your outside activities, using jealousy to control you, making you account for your whereabouts, right? So just something to think about. So we're gonna spend the next 10 to 15 minutes or so moving beyond this wheel. So this wheel has been an amazing, amazing contribution to our movement, I think, Really, you know, this was developed in 1980 by a group of survivors who were in a support group together who were wanting to figure out a way to communicate their experience, to share that with other people. It wasn't meant to be like the popular, like, you see it everywhere, this is the thing that we know, that we base all of our experiences on. It didn't really come to be that way. And so we talk about moving beyond the power and control wheel with an utmost reverence for what created it. And also what we know is that we can't just put like homophobia, racism <laughs> around the outside, like classism, immigration, and then just assume that that's going to be reflective of the very sort of like nuts and bolts day-to-day -day experiences of a different community, right? I know I see them all the time with like a different sort of thing on the outside. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. So we're going to take a few minutes to move beyond the power and control wheel and talk about some of the specific contexts of LGBT people's lives that impact their experience of domestic violence that may make them more vulnerable that I think is important for all of us to be aware of. One of the primary um, things that we see coming up for folks um, is an experience of isolation. Um, and within that is this process of outing or coming out, right? So people know what coming out means? Does someone want to share what that is? your definition of coming out? Our trusty helper is ready. She's at the ready. <laughs> you can just shout it out. I know you know. Yeah. Probably just voluntarily or involuntarily acknowledging your sexuality to the world. Right. So some of you may know, but that LGBT people, we have to like go through a whole process, right? Because you're straight until proven otherwise. That's what's called heterosexism. Um, this idea of coming out is particular in a lot of ways to LGBT people's experiences. So it's this process of disclosing, whether voluntarily or non-voluntarily. Mine was non-voluntary when I was a teen. My mother called me when I was in college. I was like 18. Do you want to hear my story real quick? Um, she called me and she was like, you were home last week and you didn't pick up the dry cleaning. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. She was like, oh, that's, it's just really not OK for you to just come home and then not contribute or whatever. Are you gay? <laughs> and I was just like, what? <laughs> my little sister went in my email anyway. Showed my mother some emails. Totally was helpful, because I wouldn't have come out on my own. But that's an example, right, of like, that wasn't my choice at the time. And also that I come out all the time. I come into a room, people don't read me as a queer person, right? stunningly dressed as though I may be. <laughs> and so this process of coming out is not a one-time thing, right? It's something that people have to engage in all the time. It looks different ways for different people. It means different things in different communities. But what it is is something that we really need to think about in the context of safety planning and in the context of domestic violence, right? So threatening to out someone is very compelling, right? Because in many places, like the state that I'm from, Ohio, um, it is legal for you to be fired for being gay, right? It's, we have civil protections in the state of Washington, do you in, yes. in California? But in a lot of places, that is very powerful. And even if you may be protected under the law, if they out you to your family, to your faith community, what is that going to mean for your life, for your access to who you are, to your family, to the people who support you and who love you? Right? So we want to get a sense of, is someone out? And if they are or aren't, how is that impacted 
in that pattern of power and control. We also have seen many times people who have been out for many years and in the course of surviving domestic violence are sort of pulled back into a closet. Right? It's not safe for me to be out, so if you're out, it's going to jeopardize me, so then you can't go to your soccer club, your book club, the bar, your faith congregation, etc., because it's not safe for me. So what does that do? It isolates someone, right? I sort of see isolation as like that sort of foundation that is laid to make someone more vulnerable to what is happening, because if you eliminate someone's ability to say, like, that feels weird, you're right, that feels weird, what do you want to do about that? Or if it's just in your own head, we're like, Really, transphobia is a big deal. Maybe I shouldn't go to that thing anymore. I don't want to jeopardize my partner's life because transphobia is real in the world, right? Another thing that we talk about really critically um, in our work is this idea of using vulnerabilities. We think often there's been this sort of archetype as a, a person who batters their partner um, as being like big and strong and uh, they've always are the one that has the money and you're having to like hide a $10 bill into your bed to run out in the middle of the night or something. Um, that's not our experience all the time with the survivors that we work with, right? That folks can use their experience of very real vulnerabilities in the world to exploit their partners, right? So if your partner has a very real experience of being a genderqueer or trans person in the world and experiencing employment discrimination where they get fired or are forced out of a job, and then there's an insinuation that you need to get another job and another job and support them, it's really hard to argue with the fact that the world is transphobic. Is that true? Yes. Right? Is that person's experience of transphobia true? Yes. Is them making you responsible for that? It's true, but is that contributing to a pattern of power control and exploitation? Absolutely, right? It's limiting your choices. But we want to really be aware of that we're not always looking for who has more money, who has more access, who has whatever, right? I've talked to many survivors who have every open door available to them to leave, right? That sense that people should just be doing that, making that choice. <clears throat> but that there's a way that that exploitation can become very pervasive and not wanting that person to experience those really real vulnerabilities in the world. Using children. Um, <clears throat> in a lot of other communities, this is uh, important to think about as well, but in many states, folks are not allowed to be the legal parents of their children. Um, many folks co-parent or are active in the lives of kids. In some states, there are legal remedies of which to be a second parent um, on a birth certificate, so there's second parent adoption in the state of Washington. So sometimes I think, oh, well, we have these legal rights and protections. That's really great. That's really important. And in order to get a second parent adoption, you need the first parent's permission, right? You also need money to pay for a social work visitation, often an attorney to help you with the legal paperwork. So financially speaking, that's not often within someone's sort of range of abilities to access, right? And so if we think about the threat of having no contact with your children, how that's going to impact your experience of that relationship. There was a woman that we, um, had worked with a, a coworker of mine had worked with a number of years ago who um, had a 12 or she was a 10 year old daughter um, she was a non-biological parent of but had conceived of the the child and raised her um, didn't have second parents option the biological parent was not amenable to that plan whatsoever um, and she said to her advocate I need you to safety plan with me for the next eight years because I'm not leaving I'm not leaving until my daughter is 18 and she can decide to see me or not. And it was this, this really humbling moment for us, right? That like, people make hard choices all the time. How can we imagine what it's like to make that choice, right? But that what we needed to do was show up because that was her saying, as an agent, that is what I want, that is what I need. And maybe down the line she would make a different choice, her situation or circumstances would change. But we needed to be aware that the reality of her life was that she was not gonna make that choice irregardless of the violence she was experiencing at the hands of her partner, right? And the fact that she did not have legal relationship to her child, whether or not she could have argued that in court, she, that was the farthest thing from her mind, the farthest thing from her region accessing, right? Using small communities. So um, I moved from Ohio. I was a 4-H'er. Anyone else was in the 4-H? Yeah! In Ohio, in Ohio where? Yeah. Southeastern Ohio. I went to OU in Athens. Oh, go Buckeyes. 
<laughs> um, anyway, so maybe you can also uh, speak to this, but Ohio's, um, there's not, there's, there's some gays there, right? Um, but it wasn't like the, the funnest place of life um, to be an out person. Um, at least on my college campus, there were a lot of experiences of um, sort of hate violence, bias violence against um, myself and folks in my life. And so one of the things that I did was think about like, where could I move that I could have a different kind of community or a different kind of experience? Little did I know I could get a gay job and be professionally gay. It's possible. <laughs> Tara, right? You're telling me about your faded, get the attorney, DV, queer job of your dreams. It's possible, people. <laughs> keep dreaming. Um, but one of the things that I knew was that I wanted to find somewhere with a community, right? And so I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to move to Seattle. There's so many queer people there. It's going to be great, so progressive. And I show up there, and it feels so similar in terms of like, everybody knows everybody, right? How many lesbian bars are there? One, right? Like most major cities. Um, and so what that meant, I tell you that little story because uh, it is very easy then to gather information about someone if there are fewer gathering places, if there are fewer degrees of separation, right? It makes stalking not even very difficult. Can you say, oh, who, you know, who was Tara talking to the other night? Oh, did she talk to her ex? What did she look like? Was she drunk? Was she drinking? How much money did she spend? Right? People ask stuff like that all the time. We wouldn't necessarily identify that as stalking behavior, but it's getting people information that can contribute to a pattern of power and control. One of the things that we find to be incredibly important is that we safety plan for people to see their batterers. Right? Not that we're like, go out there and do it, right? But this sense of like, you need to avoid every place you ever went. What does that mean for your quality of life? You basically would have to leave town. Because there are like, there's one bookstore, there's one bar, there's one, you know, Mormon gay people, you know, all of these things. And so the option of saying then you don't get to access those supports anymore is not something that we want to advocate. What we want to do though is be very, very aware of someone's situation, the safety concerns that they're working with, and support them to reduce the harm and also not then become further isolated. Right, that their partner who's battering them gets to have all the free reign in that community as they want. We don't want to encourage the survivor to continue to sink out of those places that can affirm and support you as a person. So really quickly, um, leveraging institutional violence, I think this is going to come up probably a bit in the um, scenario work, but what we know is that there are many institutions where in which LGBT people have um, very complicated histories. Uh, the police and the legal system being one large, large one. Um, and then also we can think about things like the medical system, mental health system, etc. So that when we as a, as a movement have decided that number one on our voicemail machines we should say if you're in danger call 911, for a lot of communities, that's not going to be the most helpful remedy. If you're undocumented, right? Like, there are a whole list of communities where in which that wouldn't be the blanket recommendation I would make for safety planning. Specifically, what we want to do is really get a sense from someone, is this a resource that you feel like you want to access? How can we make that safer for you? But also understand that because queer people have over time had a historically negative and violent relationship with the law enforcement, with the legal system, that people may not find that to be a place to go to increase their safety. Nor do many people want to see their partners engaged in that system. I was just talking to someone on Monday who is being stalked by an ex-partner who is a queer person of color, who is also genderqueer, and she is struggling so deeply about what does it mean for her to call the cops, though this person is literally hiding in a bush outside of her house. Because what she does not want is for that person to get put in jail because of what that means for their life in a really real way, right? And so it's not only does this person feel vulnerable themselves, but that people care about what happens to their partner even though they don't like what's happening to them. Does that make sense? Okay. The last one really quickly, um, alcohol and drug abuse, so there's higher rates of alcohol and drug use um, in queer communities that we see to be very directly linked um, to the fact that many of us, could you start handing these out, have been forced to create community in marginalized spaces like bars, 
so what has happened is that we've gathered in these spaces, bars, nightclubs, etc., because those were often the spaces that people could go to to access community, to be with people like themselves. And not too long ago, corporations also noticed that there's people spending money, right? So I don't know if any of you have been to like Seattle Coors Light, Jägermeister Pride, Marlboro Festival, right? <laughs> that. People, I mean, people are spending money. Corporations, Absolute Vodka for one of them, is spending a lot of money advertising in our community. And it's something to be aware of that batters can use and leverage ongoing consequences of addiction as well as criminalization around drugs and alcohol to their advantage in creating a pattern of power and control. Really quickly, a couple of barriers that we want to be aware of. Um, barriers in the criminal legal system, and DB movement priorities and services orientation. So many of you may be aware that most um, sort of shelter-based emergency domestic violence housing are primarily for women, almost exclusively for women, right? So what does that mean for a survivor who doesn't identify as a woman, who is in need of emergency confidential domestic violence housing? It means you are out of luck most of the time unless someone can help you get a hotel voucher. and though folks who identify as women who are LBTG um, may access those resources, this whole sense of a uh, women's only space being a safe space is really shattered when we start talking about abuse in lesbian relationships. I have worked with people whose partners have followed them into a domestic violence shelter. It's not that hard to figure out how to answer the questions on the phone line with the advocate. Do you want to say I'm the one who strangled someone? No, you're not going to say that, right? So is that, like, the sense of creating women's only spaces is going to be safe spaces is something we really have to be thoughtful about. Um, we also want to think about police misconduct, institutional violence. Also, the relationship recognition issues, so how the law understands our relationships, how then it understands property, kids, et cetera. And also, the overwhelming, I think, silence in the LGBTQ community about domestic violence is something that I find particularly interesting and challenging. Um, my personal perspective is that um, I think in many ways it's really connected to this sense of like here we are sort of like fighting to get this like kind of piddly paltry seat at the table and we need to be as much like you as good as right as worthy of these things and so these parts of our communities that make us look bad even though it happens right in heterosexual relationships um, we're just not going to engage with. Right? And so, one, that it makes it diff difficult as a movement, and two, what happens then also is that there's no language for queer people about what's happening to them every day. And so when we changed our name from Advocates, to, of Advocates for Abused and Battered Lesbians, which was the network's original name in the 80s, to the Northwest Network of Bisexual, Trans, Lesbian, and Gay Survivors of Abuse, we did some focus groups, surveys, and people said, domestic violence is what happens to straight people, but my partner's abusing me. Right? We may think, oh, language, what does that mean? It meant something significant to these people about their experience. And then lastly, we also talk about um, survivors' use of violence. We spoke about that briefly. OK. So everyone should have a little yellow slip in front of them. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person beside you, or maybe the two people beside you, if that's most convenient. And I'm going to ask you to describe how a batter would use this behavior, so there's a behavior on your sheet, to establish or maintain a pattern of power and control over their partner. So you could just make up a little like example or a little sentence that would be like a story of that. So you're just gonna have like one minute, so just whatever comes to your brain, there's no right or wrong answers. Okay, so turn to your partner. How would a batter use this behavior to reinforce a pattern of power and control? Okay. Can I get everyone's attention? I can tell by your chattering that you are having excellent examples, and we'll get to them in a minute. All right. Using that same behavior, so the exact one you have in your hands, describe how a survivor would use the same behavior to resist or survive a pattern of power and control. Go. Same exact behavior. Okay, could I get everyone's attention back as a large group? That was so good. Thanks, guys. Um, all right, so if I could get a volunteer or two, maybe two people who'd be willing to share. Let's go back to the first question. So if you could read your behavior out loud and then tell us 
the example of how a batterer would use this behavior to assert or maintain a pattern of power and control. Any willing volunteers? Thank you. Yeah, it says slaps partner across the face. So it says slaps partner across the face is, is their behavior. What was your example? An example of like um, the partner tries to slap you in the face. You can block it to resist it. I don't know. I guess you can try to like stop it somehow. Totally. You totally could. Like with cool. your hands or something and then not tolerate it and just. Right. So what are, what are some of the consequences that people might experience if they're slapped? Like how might that feel? You guys can just say it out loud. You don't need a microphone. Powerless. Powerless, humiliating, right? So that when a person slaps their partner, that could be a consequence of that. And then people could attempt to resist that, absolutely. Sometimes they have the ability to do that. Sometimes they don't. And then if we think about what would a context be where in which a, a survivor would slap their partner in the course of surviving a pattern of power and control? You're welcome to share, or if you'd like to pass the mic, we can do that as well. What if your group members want to share? It's OK. There's no right or wrong answers. Why don't we, do, does anyone, if you don't want to talk about that, does anyone think about how a survivor might, might slap their partner in the context of? Surviving, yes. Oh, self-defense. That's great. So I heard a couple of self-defenses. What else? Just shout it out, Kevin. I know your name. Using to draw attention, to bring outside intervention. Mm-hmm. So to draw attention, to try to intervene, to try to make something else happen. To try to regain their own personal power. To try to regain their own personal power. So there's a whole gamut of things, right? But notice, and this is not uncommon and not wrong either. People's first instinct is self-defense, right? that the only reason a survivor would slap someone is in self-defense. What do we know about the reality of people's lives? When violence is currency in your relationship, that's sometimes what people are working with, right? If someone's been screaming at you and you need to go to work in the morning and it's four in the morning, and you know slapping them might let you get two hours of sleep, though you don't feel good about it, that could be in the course of surviving. You regret the, this is not a good choice, bad choice conversation, right? What we know is, is that behavior in particular could be used by a batterer to assert or maintain a pattern of power and control and could, and could also be used by a survivor in the context of surviving domestic violence, right? This is not like, that was a good idea or bad idea. It's just a real idea. Did you want to share your example? Sure, uh, it's uh, attempts to Thank jump, jump out of a moving vehicle. Attempts to jump so out of a moving vehicle. If it was the batterer doing it, I would say my example was that they're using it to Control the survivor, uh, control the victim by uh, saying, like, if, if let's say the person being abused is driving the car, mm -hmm. threatening to leave, and they want to leave and they want out, the batterer might say, No, if you leave me, I'm going to jump out of this car, and then the, batter, and the person driving is going to back off, and, and they're going to they're gonna back down from the threat to leave because they don't want their partner to hurt themselves, even though they're being abused by that same person. Right, absolutely. So, and then I would say a survivor is going to do it because it's natural protection of life. Right. They're, they're trying to protect themselves and trying to do whatever they have to do, no matter what the risk. Right. Because they don't feel that they can, they have any other choice at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And when we think about that, like natural protection of life, jumping out of a moving car, like that is serious business, right? Like if that's the choice, stay in this car or jump out of it. Jumping out of it is a safer place to be. That's a pretty unsafe place. Right? So this is, thank you for all of your, your contributions. These are really excellent. What we were wanting to do with this exercise is to get us to really think about that there aren't one, like we already discussed, there isn't one type of person, one way that survivors are, that people who batter their partners are, nor are there behaviors that are exclusive to survivors or behaviors that are exclusive to batterers. Were most of you, by a show of hands, able to come up with an example for both? Was it a little bit hard at times? I normally hear a lot of talking in the beginning with the first question and then less with the second, which is totally normal because a lot of these physically restrains partner. What do I think about that on a first instinctual level? That's what batters do, right? It's not wrong. It's also just not complete, 
right? And the reason we want to think about this is that often what we have done as a movement to determine people's eligibility for services is to ask a list of behaviors. Did you do this or did this happen to you? Right? Because what we have had historically to rely on was gender as the indicator of how a pattern of power and control might be working. And in heterosexual relationships, that is predominantly accurate. Right? It's not like that was a bad idea. It's just an idea that does not translate. One might think why, right? Because then all we're doing is comparing behaviors. We're not seeing someone's male privilege, right? We're not seeing that their violence is encouraged societally. What we're seeing is someone presenting us with behaviors, and so we have to develop a way to determine how a pattern of power and control is functioning so that we're directing both people to the appropriate services, not throwing away batters because they're crappy people. We want to support their accountability, and also we want to get support for survivors that are experiencing domestic violence. So the Northwest Network has developed an assessment tool that we've used in our work to help us determine, and the way we talk about it is that it helps us determine the best resource for that individual, because that is true. I do not want to be engaging in this like super sneaky sleuthing of like, you give me all the right answers and I'll let you in the door, and then if you give me the wrong answers, then screw you, we're not talking to you anymore. <laughs> well, it can get very like bunker type mentality, right? When you're working with like trauma survivors, when the rest of the world is like, we'll take your money away, we don't take you seriously, you know? <laughs> like people can get very like intense about those boundaries, right? What we know though is that everyone deserves to be heard and that also if we can engage with folks who are battering their partners and follow through and connect them to resources that could have a different impact than just saying, you sound like a dude I'm hanging up on you, which is what happens at a lot of DV shelters, hotlines, right? So a couple of principles from this uh, assessment tool. One is that we're looking for the movie versus the snapshot. So we're not looking at that incident like the incident model of that criminal legal definition of domestic violence, we're looking at what happened across a span of time, right? We're also looking for the context, intent, and effect of these behaviors on the relationship. When we start talking about context and domestic violence, people start to be like, oh, like, victim blaming's coming down. <laughs> you gotta run away from it. Like, justify everyone's behavior. Um, that's not what we're talking about but that the context gives us information, right? The intent of the behavior gives us information. The intent of what you were describing, those are wildly different, and I could totally follow where you were going. Could everyone follow where he was going? Right, we could imagine those possibilities. And the effect of that, both in the moment and then in the long-term sense of who has fewer choices, who has more choices, is something we want to be aware of, and this assessment tool allows us to determine. And so, we want to be looking about the context, intent, and effect of behaviors, agreements, and events in order to determine who is establishing a system of power and control in an abusive relationship. If you think that this might be interesting, you should come to our training. <laughs> Scholarships are available, especially if you're a student. Um, this, we do a two and a half day training. There are flyers out on the table that we spend the majority of it um, on the assessment tool. We have a Q&A alum in the room over here. Um, so maybe you could hear about how excellent of a training it is. It's the best. Yeah! <laughs> um, anyway, so seriously, this is a, um, exciting work, not just because I work there, but also because I found it compelling enough to want to contribute to this work. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Tara and Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. It's a little warm in here, right? Um, <laughs> Darren, I think, is doing everything under the sun to get it to be a little less warm in here. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to engage in a lot of activities that keep you moving around and thinking so that you don't fall asleep uh, and or melt to death. Um, one of the things, this is the first time um, that I've had the opportunity to see Kristen uh, do this training. And I, I actually thought it was phenomenal. I've been doing this work for about 20 years, and I just learned um, about six billion new things. So um, one of the things that I think Tara and I are going, and oh, I'm sorry, I'm Sharon Staple at the uh, New York City Anti-Violence Project. One of the things that Tara and I are going to try and do is, is integrate a lot of the information that Kristen gave you um, into a, the legal assessment portion of the training, because part of what we'd like for you all to take away from this is that 
it is nearly impossible to try and provide uh, competent legal services for LGBTQ people without understanding all of what Kristen was uh, talking about, particularly for those folks who are um, in violent relationships. So Kristen talked a lot about the behavior of um, the partners in a relationship. And one of the things that we're going to talk about in this um, legal analysis portion of, of uh, our conversation tonight is also behavior. We're going to be assessing behavior and, and looking at behavior. Um, but before we do that, I just want to um, take a, a step back and talk about the other thing that I think that the legal system must assess um, that is particular to LGBTQ <coughs> people. Um, and that is the, the legitimacy of that person and the legitimacy of their relationship to any number of um, people in their lives, their partners, their kids, their family members, their community, their employer, um, their ability to get public assistance, their ability to get housing, all of these things um, are also seen through the lens of the relationship um, recognition that the court has or, or chooses not to have of particular individuals or particular relationships. Um, I'm in uh, New York City, which is considered to be a pretty liberal place, uh, but it is in uh, located in New York State, which is uh, a much less liberal place in the world. And I think because most folks think of New York State as New York City, they assume that we have all of these fantastic protections for LGBT folks. And in New York City, that's in part true, um, but in New York State, it absolutely isn't. Uh, New York State won't recognize marriages, for example, um, unless you want to get a divorce, which is kind of interesting. Um, there are domestic partnerships that are valid in some counties, including New York City and the counties there, um, but not in, say, the next county over or three counties um, over from there. Um, and so one of the things that we have to think a lot about in New York is not just what behavior occurred, but will the court recognize this person in this relationship in this county or in this state? before we can determine what legal remedies may or may not be available. And Darren spoke a lot about systemic change and, and looking at institutional changes. And so one of the things that we also look at, um, and I think I'm both Tara and I and, and a lot of other uh, legal advocates working with advocates like Kristen and the Northwest, Nor Northwest Network, one of the things we're always trying to do is think about how we change institutions or change systems. Um, but one of the things that we also have to be aware of is that the change, you know, and, and for those of you who are actually um, in law school right now, the assessment of a case is always what's the worst thing that could happen, not what's the best thing that could happen, right? Am I going to move the law back 5, 10, 20 years? Am I going to create a situation where it'll be another 10, 15, 20 years before we'll be able to move forward on these rights if I lose? And so that's a part of the assessment that we do as well when we're talking about institutional or systemic change. But we're going to talk with you tonight about two scenarios that um, Tara has brilliantly uh, created. They are chock full of issues. Uh, we'll never get to all of the issues in the scenarios, but we're going to ask you to get to as many as possible. And one of the things we want you to think about is what how does the court view this behavior? What, you know, what what are the what are the the ways that um, these behaviors or or these relationships may be interpreted that would then allow for us to analyze what um, legal remedies may or may not be available and what other needs or obstacles or solutions um, the person that you're working with may have or or may be able to pursue so did you um just to add real quickly a few couple other points and i do want to do this real quickly. But I think another thing to think about is even when you have relationship recognition or certain forms of recognition and protection, how is it that externalized issues of bias as well as internalized issues of bias, oppression, homophobia, transphobia play out? So I heard earlier the example of employment and how, yes, in 50, nearly 50% 50 of states you can be fired simply on the basis of your sexual orientation, um, even more on the basis of your gender identity. That being said, and we have have protection in California, 
we all are so most of us are going to be at will employees so mm -hmm. six weeks down the road um, you may be fired for quote unquote other reasons right um, and I think that's really important also to be thinking in terms of marriage may be one step but even if we have same-sex marriage there's sort of the multitude of ways that queer relationships are defined that aren't necessarily going to fit into that sphere and how this advocacy is going to continue to be necessary and particularly as um, attorneys and advocates how we're going to continue to need to come up and identify creative ways uh, to work with clients um, empower clients with information and you know, move the process forward. And you know, one thing that I was, it just occurred to me when Tara was speaking is, um, part of the reason that we're talking to you tonight is because we know that you are either currently practicing law or um, going to be practicing law. And you will, as Darren uh, mentioned, whether you sort of like it or not, uh, be running into people who have questions or need assistance because of domestic violence. Um, and some of those folks are going to be LGBT or Q. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about this analysis, whether it's, you know, sort of California or New York or Washington or whatever state you're from or Ohio. Who's, who's from Ohio? Somebody Me and you. Um, is that... Uh, because the federal government still legally discriminates against LGBTQ people by refusing to recognize us as, as individuals and recognizing our relationships, the this analysis is different if, you know, if, if I live in California and I create some sort of legally recognized relationship with my partner and then I decide to move to Kansas, the, the question then becomes, do I still have that legally recognized relationship? And so it's important to have some flexibility in a, be, being able to think about this analysis because it needs to be malleable to the situations that people find themselves in and, and literally the, the, the way that they travel throughout the world. So. All right, so what we're going to do here is basically divide the room in half, right? This side of the room is going to be, um, and we'll go from the microphone over, um, this side of the room is going to be group one, or scenario one, and this side of the room is going to be scenario two. And then we want you to partner with about four or five people around you. Right? First, sort of look at what are the issues that are being presented in your scenario. Uh, second, sort of identify what are the general obstacles, and then think about what are the potential solutions. Um, and if there's legal remedies that you know about, also sort of try to bring that in. But we're just also trying to get, generally, what do you think could be the solutions in this case? Maybe the best solutions are non-legal. And so we want people sort of thinking about those different terms. We're going to give you about 12 oh, to 15 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have people report back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> then we're going to have people report back. And also in that, if you could identify a point person from your group as the speaker. Um, and we'll go around and also allow for sort of Q&A in the process. And if you have questions, we'll be walking around. Uh, so I guess go ahead, break off, and get started. All right, just for everyone's on the same page, I'm going to read real quickly scenario one. I'm going to skip out some of the facts, but that way just for everyone sort of knows what we're talking about. So scenario one involves Eva, who is an undocumented transgender woman who moved from the U.S. from El Salvador three years ago. Uh, she worked for her uncle um, above his shop. He, uh, she was kicked out because she didn't dress like a man. She ended up um, basically on the streets and began engaging in survival sex work. Uh, several months ago, she was arrested and she pled no contest and was put on probation. And um, basically last night, Eva went on a date with John, who is someone she's been seeing um, for about the last two months. Uh, they met at a hotel in the gay district of town where she was prohibited from being because of probation. And um, in effect, she was sort of sexually assaulted. Uh, she passed out. Um, the ambulances came, and she, uh, a neighbor called 911. Uh, when she was interviewed, they uh, discovered her background in sex work, um, basically started questioning her, and they have not proceeded with charges against John. Um, also at the ER, the SART nurse uh, refused to do a rape kit. She's come into your office, and she is seeking help. So um, why don't we start right here with what some of the issues. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, what was the first thing up there? Um, what some of the issues were, just some that you identified. 
couple of the issues where Eva was a victim of an assault, mm -hmm. um, passed out like an almost homicide. Mm -hmm. um, PD um, threatened to um, um, have her arrested, even though she was a victim of a crime. Um, did not uh, continue their investigation. That's that's an issue. They released the um, John. ER nurse didn't complete an exam, didn't do her duties. Um, the other issues would be that she, you know, she is on probation and uh, here illegally. Okay. Um, what about in this back group? Did you guys identify any other issues or was that pretty much the main things you saw? Um, some of the other things that we had, had talked about um, was uh, as, as advocates specifically, um, really focusing on the, the the immediate medical care aspect and and seeing if that was some uh, something that she wanted job training and access to um, hormones was another issue and um, possible relocation because of uh, John lives in the same area and also um, in regards to her probation her not having access to uh, kind of the LGBT area of town Great. Uh, any other issues identified before we move on to the second one? In the back over here. Yeah. Uh, there was an issue with the shelter for one thing, and there was another issue of uh, arresting a person and letting them go when they weren't supposed to be released, especially without a date, rape kits sort of thing. And uh, there was discrimination, obviously, by the the nurse and there was homophobia in the very beginning from her fa from her uncle that led her into a situation where she had no shelter, no money, and was forced to become a sex worker rather than get a proper job in the country she lives in. Okay. Anything else, or is that pretty much cover? Um, okay, uh, so we're going to go through all of number one, and then we'll go to number two that way. Oh, we're not bouncing back and forth. So um, I feel like some of the issues and obstacles clearly overlap. Uh, in this case, and maybe we can start over here um, with the group in the very back, what were some of the obstacles that you identified? Well, um, one area that um, seems an obstacle is her uh, immigration status. Mm -hmm. um, we identified unfair termination as having taken place and how to deal with that under those circumstances, whether any federal hate crime legislation would apply in this case, um, and the uh, civil rights violations that may have occurred and how her immigration status may or may not impact that. Great, thank you. Um, was there anything else over here identified? Okay, how about over here under obstacles? Down here. There are all kinds of obstacles here. Um, we don't know the terms of her probation mm -hmm. and what the probation officer is like and what's gonna happen to her if and when it becomes known that she violated her probation. Um, we don't know exactly what her medical condition is because um, she could have been violently, um, you know, uh, compromised besides with an SID or something else involved in that uh, rape. Um, she, uh, you know, she has a, a, a real problem in terms of homelessness and, and housing, which um, I think basically what I'd approach this as a lawyer is not just wearing a legal and advocate hat, but also as a counselor, trying to give her, find out what she needs and what she wants, what outcomes she'd like. And I think a lot of these things are just not legal. They're practical. Right. So. Absolutely. Um, and one of the things we are definitely trying to encourage people here is that when you're, um, if you are an attorney or a law student or maybe in the situation, is to talk to advocates and to talk to other um, sort of help, you know, people who can, who have worked with this on a daily basis and are going to have a lot of information and a lot of access to resources um, in addition because I think it's kind of having lots of cross, um, cross disciplinary collaboration. Uh, because can I say one thing? Yeah. Um, one of the other, one of the other things that I think is a, a huge obstacle in, um, in this case is we're dealing with a transgender woman of color who is undocumented and a sex worker, right? So her identity can be an obstacle if she's engaging in the systems that 
we as lawyers or law students or even sometimes advocates are sort of trained to think about as um, solutions, that those actually become obstacles, right? And so I think one of the other um, things that we really think is an important takeaway from this uh, conversation that we're having tonight is a legal lens alone is not going to meet the needs of this person. Um, a, an advocacy lens alone may not meet all the needs of this person. Um, but together, and, and through a lot of what Kristen was talking about today in terms of self-determination being sort of the first and foremost principle of what exactly does this person want to do first, that's how we're going to begin to approach some of the, the, the obstacles um, that may be a result of bias against someone's identity, plain and simple, regardless of what they did um, or who they're with, right? Um, and I think uh, just in, you know, in terms of time, let's talk a little bit about solutions and remedies very briefly. Uh, and what you may tell Eva, maybe some of her options, whether or not she decides to go with any of them. Uh, how about uh, in the back, we'll start with you guys. That's up there. <laughs> OK, some of the options could be possibly filing, if, if she was into it, for a U visa. Um, again, relocation, um, looking into different job skills, um, and trying to figure out a clinic to where she could get access to hormones. And again, depending on what she wanted, because hormones might be the number one on her list. And I know I've worked with clients to where, you know, that was the number one thing on their list. So it just depends. Anyone else? Uh, how about over here? Any other remedy solutions people thought about oh, over here? I think in terms of location, uh, right away I thought of a perhaps of a place where she actually could exercise her right as a woman to actually sell her body, you know, prostitution, wherever prostitution is legal. So I would actually, you know, present the option of sending her perhaps to Vegas. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have just a real quick, uh, what about, did people think of a restraining order in this case? Mm -hmm. Did people think that was an option for her? Well, we talked about that in, in, in our group um, and, and trying to really differentiate between whether or not it was a dating relationship or not, or if it would be perceived as a dating relationship and how that would play out. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, great. Okay, so let's uh, quickly move, and we're going to discuss, if we have a little time, we'll go back to this, but let's go ahead and move to question number two. Um, basically, George has been in a relationship for six years with a man named Mark. Uh, the two have a child, Sarah, who is currently three years old. Um, last night, the partner came home and was high on crystal meth, a substance he had been using for, for the last few months, um, and began attacking him. The partner punched him in the stomach and at one point grabbed a knife. He also threatened him that if he tried to leave, he would never see his daughter again. Uh, George is seeking your assistance because the violence has escalated for some time now. Um, and it turns out that Mark is basically the sole adoptive parent of the child, who is actually um, biologically was uh, Mark's sisters. Now, um, George is worried generally that um, if he does try to do something, he may lose access to his daughter. He's also um, making just sort of barely above minimum wage and they are currently and he's just a little bit worried about what he would do in terms of support uh, okay let's start out in terms of some of the issues and why don't i start out back here uh, you had the mic uh, some of the issues were uh, safety issues mm -hmm. um, was CBS involved on the child's behalf? Uh, did there are no rights to visit with the child uh, or work? Uh, financial stability uh, or instability that may be there? Uh, a housing issue now? Uh, mm -hmm. If, if uh, George cannot afford the housing, then mm -hmm. uh, And the illegality of the, the meth or drug use. Okay, great. Um, over here, did people identify any additional issues? Um, I think, well, 
I think the obstacles and issues sort of are they kind blend of blend together in this one. <laughs> one of the other ones that we talked about was the, the catch twenty two. If he gets it without a job, he can't afford daycare. With a job, the child is with a drug using partner, uh, and who knows what else. And that's with I mean it takes there's only one possible remedy for that, which would be helping find a new job that could also provide that provides daycare somewhere that might not be a viable option. The other issue was that without knowing within the scenario, you don't know really what the state's laws are for second parent, if second parent adoption is allowed. You don't know whether they're living in a community where what level of outness are they? Are they only known as roommates outside of their the apartment or is there something else? Is their relationship even legally recognized? So all those things, if he was, that determines whether it kind of dictates what his fear might be with child services being called. If they're not really known outside of here as a in a relationship outside of maybe the, the apartment building, child services, the neighbors might be calling in because they don't like them, because mm -hmm. there's homophobia <laughs> going on. So those are a few Absolutely. of the other ones. Uh, did you have any either issues or additional obstacles? The same one, I, I would also say, I would also say um, support system. We said, what kind of support support system does he have? Um, especially if he's out seeking help, was there anyone he can count on as well? Because everything just kind of falls together. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, over here, why don't we start with some of the legal issues, remedies that you were potentially coming up for in this situation? Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> um, so. We came up with three different legal solutions. Um, the first one, I'm not actually sure if this is correct. So I was thinking maybe that he could go into probate court and get a legal guardianship. I don't know if he could do that starting here in probate court. Okay. He might be able to. So that would be a way to kind of um, for the Department of Children and Family Services getting involved. Um, and then pending kind of what happens with that, I think the best alternative option um, instead of doing the second parent adoption would be trying to get a family court order um, where he would be like found as 7611 D dad. So if he can show the family court, I put myself out as the father of this child and the family court might grant him legal status as the father. Um, and then the other legal solution that or option that we talked about was a restraining order. But the, there is definitely kind of a dual side of that. He might not want a restraining order. Also, if he doesn't have any kind of legal rights to his child, that presents a lot of issues. Um, is how can he see his child if technically he's not supposed to be seeing the father of the child? Um, but then, you know, somebody else brought up that they felt really strongly about getting a restraining order for safety issues. So that's what we talked about. Okay. Um. Can I call on Marilyn real quick to see if you had any additional issues since you're a long-term family law attorney or remedies? My concern with that, since the daughter... Since the child is three years old, that the system might have a bias in favor of a traditional family and might see that this child would be better off without Mark, George, or the mom, whatever happened with the mom. So, and then also we were thinking that he might need to get an evening job that would pay better at a restaurant and then maybe he could get some, just some evening care for the child and not have so much of a daycare problem. So. Okay. Tara, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> did, did anyone think about, and it was so interesting listening to you um, list all of the legal remedies. I am. Uh, by training a family law attorney as well, and I immediately go to the sort of like, which one of these categories? But did anyone consider that one of the options is that he stays in the relationship? No. No? Yes? Because I mean, I, I think, because I think I, that was one of the um, things that I think Kristen brought up in her training is that, you know, listen, for the next eight years, let's do some safety planning because this is where I'm going to be until this kid turns 18. And I think for so, so many people, and I mean so many people, but particularly LGBTQ people where their relationships with their children are not recognized, um, depending on what state or what district they're in or whether they can move or they can't move or what their abusive partner does or doesn't let them 
um, do, the option to stay is the safest, best option for them. And as advocates and anti-violence workers, for, for at least for me, I will tell you that that really shocks me to go to that conclusion. Like my whole system goes, wait a minute, no, that can't possibly be the right solution. But sometimes it is, right? And I, I don't know. Only George is going to be able to tell me whether that's the right solution. Like, I have no sense at all. But if I can't wrap my mind around the fact that that might be a solution, then I'm not really very helpful in that situation. Because I'm going right to what does Family Court Act 821 say about whether he has a relationship with this child sufficient enough to prove um, you all were talking about uh, fitness, right? And I, that's exactly where I went when I first read this. Like, oh. Well, if Marcus is unfit, then maybe, you know, and, and really maybe he just needs to stay, right? So, sorry. Um, so basically, since we're basically, we're out of town, out of time right now, uh, I think the idea and sort of one of the goals was to give you scenarios that were chock full of different things and just to kind of be able to identify some of those issues think around some of those solutions uh, we had we were uh, I thought it was really interesting how people did not jump to the restraining order um, which is something that I think most people in the DV community are just like restraining order right that's what we're going for and people really that wasn't where this audience went so um, that was definitely interesting and in many situations it is not necessarily the best option uh, and also thinking about it and uh, just kind of for things to keep in your mind or in the back of the mind is what happens when there's cross-filed petitions mm -hmm. right which is very common in same gender relationships or where people end up in um, the criminal side of the system although they're clearly surviving abuse and how that then plays out in the legal system if you try to get a restraining order or if you're seeking protection uh, from your abusive partner yes um, are lawyers mandated reporters? No, no. Well, it depends on the state. Not in California. No, no, not in. Oh yes, are lawyers mandated um, reporters? And in California for child abuse, and for California, no. Uh, that there are a few states where they are. I don't know about New York. No. For New York, we're prohibited uh -huh. uh, from from reporting. Uh, it's attorney client privilege is uh, supersedes any mandatory reporting. However, any work that one does with a mandatory reporter like is it, it's be, like an advocate. Um, you you start to do that dance of, of who knows what where and how to be most helpful but most strategic for what the client uh, needs and that's the, no, the next two hours of our yeah. training <laughs> that, we, that we don't have. Um, and maybe uh, I believe there's going to be reception, but also if people have specific questions, if maybe we can stand up here for a little while and people can come up and ask those questions. And um, I think I just want to thank you again for all being here for I this training. Thank all of our speakers and, and you as well for your attention. And you really have amazing experts in the room, so take advantage of them. Um, and um, and they all, all agreed that follow-up questions after the training would be welcome as well. So let, can you join me please in thanking all three of our fabulous trainers.